We're still looking at the bonding in the first 20 elements, but now we moved on to discrete covalent molecular solids. The keyword being solids. Because in the first 20 elements, most of the molecular substances are gases. What's a molecule? A molecule is a little cluster of atoms. Here's a little hydrogen molecule. Here's a little nitrogen molecule. A little oxygen molecule. But these molecules all have something in common. They're all gases. Hydrogen gas, nitrogen gas, oxygen gas. How can we have a molecular solid? Well, that's because certain molecules have bigger masses than these. The mass of a hydrogen molecule is 2. A nitrogen molecule has a mass of 28. An oxygen molecule, 32. But there tends to be a trend, and that is, as the molecular mass increases, so the state changes, and we end up with solids. If we had a molecule with a big enough mass, it might well be a solid. And one such element is sulfur, another one is phosphorus. Why does a sulfur molecule have such a large mass? Well, it's down to the formula of sulfur, S8. Its molecule contains eight atoms joined together. Phosphorus is not quite so big, P4. The melting point of sulphur is 113 degrees Celsius, reflecting the fact that it's got quite a big molecule. Phosphorus, a smaller molecule, has a smaller melting point. It's a melting point of phosphorus, can't quite remember. Let's check it out. The melting point of phosphorus is 44 degrees Celsius. Here we are. Now, what does S8 represent? It represents a ring of about eight sulfur atoms organised into kind of crown shape. The phosphorus, four atoms, arranged in a tetrahedral shape. But really that's about all we need to know for these slightly unusual elements. They have unusually high melting points, given that they're little molecules, because they have quite substantial masses. Now, taking things much further, if we had a really big structure, an extremely big structure, we could call it a giant covalent network. And a giant covalent network is, as it implies, a huge structure where there are many covalent bonds. A network implies many, many atoms joined together and in this case, the bonds between the atoms are covalent bonds. So when would this situation arise? Well, you only get covalent bonds when we're dealing with a non-metal. The word covalent tends to go, tends to go with non-metal. So which elements would have a pattern something like this? Well, the three elements that have a covalent network structure are boron, carbon, and silicon. When you look at the periodic table, they're arranged something like that. These all have extremely high melting points, greater than a thousand <laughs> degrees Celsius. The melting point is very high for these. And this high melting point is caused by the fact that we're having to break strong covalent bonds to break these substances apart. Now, the one we tend to focus on is carbon. Carbon comes in three forms. There's diamond, there's graphite, and what tends to be the on and out, which is fullerene. We'll come back to fullerene later. Let's take diamond first of all. Now diamond has an extremely high melting point because it has a giant covalent network. The carbon atoms in diamond, and diamond is just carbon atoms, are arranged in a very special way, arranged in a tetrahedral structure. If you're asked to draw a diamond, you could draw that tetrahedron, join to that tetrahedron, join to this tetrahedron, and there's a little piece of diamond showing carbon atoms joined together. Carbon is the, uh, diamond is the hardest substance known. It's partly due to the fact that it contains only covalent bonds and partly due to the fact that it has 
this particular shape. Anyway, there we have it, diamond. Extremely hard substance. It does not conduct electricity. Graphite, however, does conduct electricity. Now, this is also an example of carbon. All of these substances are carbon, containing only carbon atoms. Graphite has a structure based not on a tetrahedron, but more on a hexagon. So what we have in graphite is a structure something like this. We have these hexagonal rings of carbon, and in a, a space, and another layer of hexagonal rings of carbon. Now, although these both have something in common, and that is made of carbon, they have very different properties. Graphite is a soft material. Diamond is hard. Graphite conducts electricity. Diamond does not. Why is that? Because the structure is different. In the case of graphite, the layers are held together by very weak bonds. Van des Van's forces. It doesn't take a great deal of effort to cut through these bonds and break these layers. So graphite tends to be a lubricant. It slides around. It's smooth. It's soft. And not only that, there are electrons in here. Electrons which can move. We call electrons which can move delocalized electrons. And when these electrons move through the structure of graphite, they conduct electricity, hence graphite is a conductor. You might recall having used carbon rods at some time in the past, it would have been graphite. And then finally, fullerene. Now fullerene does not have a gigantic structure. The number of atoms in here would be infinite. Likewise here, an unmeasurable number of atoms. But fullerene has a finite number of carbon atoms. Very often C60, sometimes C70. So what are we looking at here? Well, if this has a specific number of atoms, it does not have a giant covalent network. Fullerenes are molecular. If we take C60, what we're looking at is a ball shape, a sphere. And in this sphere, there are many, many carbon atoms. But not an infinite number, 60. Fullerenes are football shaped molecules containing 60 or 70 carbon atoms. There we have it, the three different kinds of carbon.